ready? Are we, are we ready for the first question? Sorry to be first, but I just can't stand it. I have this one question. I actually have more than one, but okay. Simple, simple answers, hopefully, for us childlike minds. Have mercy on us. Here's my question. If, if a parent has a child, they should have all the same attributes of that parent. That's use that you use that analogy. A human being has a human being. If a God, ha, if a de, one of the definitions of God is that He has no beginning, how could Jesus come forth at some point and have that attribute of no beginning? I can't. I can't get past that one. Okay, thank you. That's a very good question. That's a very common question, and that's a question I've had to uh, ponder over myself for a while. Short answer. This has been answered by the pioneers. E.J. Wagner, one of the messengers of 1888, said clearly that Christ proceeded forth from the Father, therefore he is divine in every essence, and his personality as the Son of God had a beginning. Let me expand on that a little bit, and hopefully that will explain it as quick as I can. Everything that Christ is made of had no beginning. His divinity had no beginning. It came from the Father. His makeup, his very substance had no beginning. It came from the Father. So in principle, everything that Christ is had no beginning. If you were to trace Christ back, you'd have to go through the Father, and you will never get to a beginning. In principle, there is no beginning there. But his personality as the Son began when he was brought forth by his father. Now that principle is brought out in scripture a number of places. Uh, you remember Paul talking about Levi paying tithes while he was in the loins of Abraham? You familiar with the, in the book of Hebrews? Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Levi was not even born yet. But in principle, Paul says Levi was in Abraham and he paid tithe. So there is a principle there that is linked because of ancestry or genealogy. The link is that there is an actual line. If we break that line, we have a problem. So Christ does not have a broken line. He goes straight through to the Father. He is of the Father. And in that principle, he has no beginning. But his personality had a beginning. Now, Wagner talked about that. So I'm just simply repeating what he said. And that was part and parcel of the 1888 message. That helps us appreciate the true position that Christ holds. So it actually highlights his position. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's how they, they understood it. Um, in Hebrew, there is, no, there is no dissonance in this area because Hebrew is a cyclical language. And therefore, the brought forth, that they have a different conception. See, we, we see father and son as father always being ahead of son. You know, son always you know, being beneath the Father. You have those illusions in the Bible, but the Hebrews don't see, never saw that big, uh, that, the issue that way. They saw a coming forth, and Brad Scott mentioned this when he was here. And as I was listening to him present, present it on a DVD, I thought to myself, oh, there you have the distinction. And, and what Natter said, I agree with. Because you do, uh, his humanity had a beginning. But the essence, the divinity, had no beginning. So there's no, there's no dissonance in Hebrew thinking in that concept. There's only dissonance in our Greek linear thinking in that kind of concept because we place the dissonance there. And so that uh, just, just an observation. And I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but you know that is that is what I understand. That Hebrew is far more. Uh, far more uh, encompassing than the Greek linear thinking, which is point A to point B. You know, the Hebrew thinking always is, is turning on itself and coming back. And so, you know, I, I anyway, I hope that, that helps. That's not really a, a position either way. It's just Hebrew, the Hebrew th thinking process was different than our thinking process. I'm sorry if you've covered this in your book because I haven't had a chance to read everything. But I've had a question. Um, it seems that Ellen White somewhere says that for every truth, Satan has a counterfeit, i.e. Christmas for tabernacles, Ishtar for Pesach. And 
he wouldn't counterfeit a $3 bill because it doesn't exist. Um, I'm thinking of part of your slideshow, uh, uh, Natter, where you showed that Babylon, Egypt, Greece, Rome, and I think one other had basically a triune God situation. If, if that's Satan's counterfeit, and he counterfeits what's true, then why would that be different, if you understand my question? Say, but uh, The counterfeit that we are all thinking of, and perhaps you're referring to, is the, uh, the false trinity referred to in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 16 where the three frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. If we look at the appearance of these three in chapters 12 and 13, we will see some interesting uh, reflections on the true uh, trinity. I put my glasses on so I can read my, my sword. Uh, when we look at chapter 12, of course, here's the appearance of the, the dragon. And we all know who the dragon is, identified in verse 9. Uh, that great uh, dragon, the devil, and the serpent, um, and Satan. Now, this dragon, uh, later on, goes in search and in pursuit of the woman and the remnant of her seed. And uh, he does something very unusual to try to um, sweep her away. You remember what that is. He opens his mouth and water. What does it say here? Verse uh, 15, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So this great torrent, this flood comes gushing out of his dragon's mouth. Now normally, what do you think normally comes out of the mouth of a dragon? Fire. But here we have the antidote for fire. We have water coming out of the dragon's mouth. And the next verse, the earth helped the woman instead of uh, that water drowning her or uh, inundating her the earth opens up its mouth. So out of one mouth comes water, and into another mouth goes the water. Now something else comes along with that water. What do we know, understand water to be? We have to jump over to Revelation 17, and we see the woman sitting on many waters. Uh, I'll finish with my explanation. You can make a comment. And uh, so we know that's peoples, don't we? Nations, tongues, and peoples. Okay. So now we come to verse, uh, chapter 13, the next part of our evil trio, uh, evil, uh, the false trinity. And that's going to be the beast. So we have out of the mouth of the dragon comes a, a frog. Out of the mouth of the, false be uh, of the beast comes a frog. And uh, this beast, where does it come? I stood upon the sand of the sea. What's the sea? It's a body of water. Where does water come from? We just had the dragon open up its mouth and water comes gushing out. Now, out of this water, this woman's going to sit on this water. Out of this water comes a beast rising up out of the sea. And, of course, we, I'm not going to go into all of this. You, you know all this stuff. Well, I'm, I'm going to show to you the relationship between the dragon, the beast. The beast comes from the dragon. The dragon gives him his seat and great authority. You, you, you know all this. Okay, there's a relationship there. What does the Father give to the Son? He gives him his authority. What does Jesus say? Matthew 28, 18. All power in heaven and earth, in authority. 
The Father gives the Son everything. The dragon gives the beast everything. He gives, he sets him up, he gives him his power, he enables him. Uh, so there's a relationship between the Father and the Son. Then we have in verse 11, chapter 13, the false prophet. Uh, not identified there, but we understand that to be the second beast who brings fire down out of heaven from inside of men. And, of course, fire is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Here's this third party that brings it down. But notice how it's described here. It is a lamb-like beast. And who wants to be the lamb? Who is the lamb, of course, is the son. And this is a lamb-like beast. So it's just identified with the true lamb of God, the son. There's the... the reflections of the false trinity in the true. I, I might just quickly add to that, uh, since you mentioned that I mentioned it. It's true that Satan has a counterfeit for every truth, but to arrive at truth, it is a dangerous thing to use Satan's errors and think that truth is a mirror of that. Satan does not have a counterfeit only, but perversions of truth and made-up errors. Satan has made up errors like a purgatory, for example. That's an error. That's not a counterfeit of anything. That's a made up error. So when it comes to God, you can't look for a counterfeit truth for purgatory. It doesn't exist. So he has taken certain truths, perverted them, and to that he added erroneous theories that he made up. So that applies to the concept of God. So it's dangerous for us to look at paganism and say, paganism has three gods, therefore the true has to be three. That's working backwards. But that's using error to establish truth. God's word establishes truth. Satan perverts that and adds to it. So I don't know if that helps answer that particular point, but there are many errors that don't have a counterfeit in truth. Okay. They're additions. But I mean, you have a, the, you have a fire of, um, you know, we, we, we have trials and tribulations, which is kind of like being put in the fire, mm. you know, f a fiery baptism kind of thing. You know, so I can see that kind of the counterfeit of this purgatory thing that you get out of it eventually. But I, I, I take your point. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I believe it was a counterfeit of, of the triune God. The dragon being the counterfeit of, of God. And the beast being the counterfeit of Jesus who came in the flesh. And then the false prophet, uh, counterfeit of the Holy Spirit, the miracle worker. And remember our study where Jesus condescended and subjected himself to the Father. That was his life is all about. We need to be careful when we look at uh, parallelisms. We need to ask first, is this a true parallel? And is the parallel dependent or independent of the association? And who is borrowing from whom? Some pagan religions had a triune God, and I believe it was a counterfeit to the real triune God. They claimed a deity was born of a virgin. Many pagan religions have a holy book. Many pagan religions believe in a flood. They were copying from the true. So you have to ask yourself, just because you're seeing something doesn't mean that it's, um, help me here, that, you're, that it's a, that it's a, a true parallel. Um, it, it's like saying, I'm not going to accept this scientific theory if it came from an atheist. Um, so we just need to be careful here that when we see a lot of these um, counterfeits, it actually gives the Bible narrative more credence. I, I guess I want to step my foot right in the middle of it. Because we've kind of been going around this. Pilate asked a very important question of the scribes and Pharisees. What then shall I do with Jesus? And I had a mentor at one time who uh, once made a statement, and it was very true. Now, he was on the wrong side of the statement, but his statement was, if your Christology is wrong, your soteriology will be wrong. If your Christology, who Yeshua was... His substance, where he came from, if that is an error, then your salvation understanding will be an error also. They are in together. And I think this is one of the issues that the early Adventist church and the church through the centuries has had to deal with. 
and that is this whole idea of who Yeshua is. And one of the stumbling blocks back in the early, with the early pioneers was whether or not he had a beginning. Now, we've kind of touched on it. But if he had a beginning, then he could not be deity. Because deity has no beginning and no ending. And Ellen White made a statement. It's been quoted many times by people who want to take what we refer to as a post-lapsarian or a pre-lapsarian view of Christ which is Christ took the nature of Adam before the fall, that want to say that uh, if he was born human, okay, he had a sinful nature. Now, we all have heard these arguments about the nature of Christ. But the nature of Christ is at the very base of the Trinity, non-Trinity, triune, you know. It's at the very base of it. Because if Yeshua was not fully divine in every way, shape, and form, he cannot be our Savior. Because, you know, and so I think that's where we actually, and that could be a whole new can of worms. Because there's people here that probably believe in pre-lapsarian and post-lapsarian. And we're not, I'm not, we're not supposed to sermonize. <laughs> but I think it's important that we understand that this is the key issue. You know, and, and, and Ellen White said, truth lies very close to the track of error. Be very, very careful. And uh, I have appreciated the spirit with which both sides have manifested their, they have instructed, they have taught, and I would trust that your questions out there will be as gracious. Because there are times that you can word a question in such a way that it is an assault, it's an attack. And so just be very careful, because that's not what we want to do. We want to examine and ask questions, but not, que not leading questions like the Pharisees did, should we pay tribute? Okay, I mean, that was a loaded question. So uh, that, I won't say any more right now. I just wanted to, to comment, as I guess I'm getting warmed up. Um, I cannot accept that Jesus, begotten of God, that part of him was from eternity, and the other half, or whatever percentage, started with a personality. I, I cannot accept that. Eternality, total eternality, is an intrinsic quality of the deity. And I think in saying that by coming out of God, he had eternality, but, but yet his personality started at a point. To me, that takes away from the totality of eternality. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, just going on your point, uh, Pastor Andy, I have a question for Sister Cheryl, talking about the Son of God. And my question is thus. Uh, in your first presentation, I think it was, sister, you said that uh, the title, or rather, the Son of God is a title given to Jesus before the incarnation. And in your explanation in Proverbs 8, you said that uh, Jesus was, uh, I can't remember the exact word you used, but he was put in the position as the Son at that time when that verse was fulfilled. He was brought forth in the sense that he was ins instituted or something of that sort. In the position of the sons, son. So my question is this: If that is so, does that mean that Jesus is the literal Son of God, or is He playing the role of the Son of God? In other words, is it just a a title He took upon Himself? Is just a position He's filling, or is He truly the Son of God? Because, as Pastor Randy said, the whole gospel is founded upon Jesus, and who is Jesus? Thank you. I gave a few um, Sister White quotes on that where in, in um, Selected Message, I think it was volume one, it says that he was pledged to be the mediator from the foundation of the world. And there were other thoughts that all three um, had, had um, a part in the plan of salvation. So from the foundation, I think when the Godhead um, discussed all that was going to be happening. Jesus or one member of the God had pledged that he was going to come down. So by title, he was the son of God. But in other verses, in Hebrews and in Psalms, where we said, this day um, have I begotten thee and what that means. Um, I was going to be born. 
Um, and in Sister White's writing, she backs that up. There would come a time when that title would become a reality in the flesh. So the, the comment on Proverbs 8 was more of an aside and a possibility, but I think I backed it up um, first, scripturally, and Sister White quotes. I hope I answered that. Is there any more? Uh, I'd like to make a comment about the name uh, we're all familiar with the text in Isaiah 9-6 that says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And uh, it goes on to say that his name shall be called, and lists all these different qualities, wonderful, uh, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His name shall be called. If he is going to be called the Son of God, because this is something that he will then in fact be, then he will be called the Everlasting Father, because at that time then he will in fact be the Everlasting Father. Do you see the difference there? One cannot come into truth in the future and the other not. Some of these names he is going to be called has to apply to all of them. Uh, Unto us a son is given. Now if we look at the New Testament, 1 John 4 verse 9, in this is manifested the love of God in that he gave his only begotten son that through him we might have life. He gave his son. And then in uh, verse 14, the father sent his son into the world to be the savior of the world. He had a son to send, as uh, one of our pioneers said, R.F. Cottrell. If he had a son to send, then I believe he was the son of God when he was sent. So that's my comment on name, titles. Do you realize the struggle that we're having here is largely the use of language? Now, when I say that, I'm not saying... Any, I tend to lean histo- you know, historically towards what Natter has, has presented. But I have heard much truth from what my sister has presented. Okay, so what am I saying? What I'm saying is whenever you use human finite language to describe an infinite concept, you are going to have a problem. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, you can quote Sister White, you can quote the Bible and tell the cows come home. But when you're trying to describe an infinite concept using finite language, I'm sorry, you can't do it. And so, uh, and I would address this to my colleagues that are, may see this on, on uh, BETV. And I'm talking about other Seventh-day Adventist ministers. There have been actions taken regarding issues like this, punitive actions towards church members because they're not in lockstep with number two of the, of the 27 fundamentals. Now, this could cause me grief, but shame on you. Shame on you for using power and control and kingly power to force other people to your understanding. And that's exactly what has happened. Whether you're feast keepers, whether you believe in the uh, Trinity or the Triunity or the duality, whether you believe in Yeshua versus Yahweh, uh, what has happened is the church fears what it doesn't understand. And fear is usually engendered by not really wanting to deal with the issue. Fear comes from what source? From Satan. Satan. So every time God says, fear not. So, you know, when the church becomes afraid of division, when the church becomes afraid of truth because it may cause division, then a real conversation never takes place because the church cuts the conversation off before it can take place. And that's sad. Now, part of that is because nobody likes conflict. I don't like conflict. Does anybody in this room like conflict? 
Well, the church fears conflict because they see it as potentially harming the organization. And so we, as, as those of us who are earnest, honest believers that are searching for truth, need to be very careful. The spirit that has pervaded this encampment needs to pervade all of our interactions with the denomination. And denominationally, we need to stop exercising kingly power over those who don't, aren't in lockstep. Now, we talk about how the pioneers would not be able to join the current Adventist church. The pioneers would have been horrified by Seventh-day Adventist belief, 28 fundamentals. They would have been horrified by that because they did not want a creed. Okay? So we need to be careful before we start throwing people out of the church. I think that should be reserved for ethical and moral failures and not doctrinal disagreements. That's what that needs to be. Now, maybe I'm, you know, somebody will take me to task for that. But that's my personal opinion, and I have a right to it. Just like have you, you have a right to your personal opinion. And anyway. I just, Sorry. Wanted, to, Go I just wanted to make a comment on God giving his son. In, I think it was the second lecture, I went through great pains to show you that the word gave is paradidomy, and it means God gave up, committed up, delivered over his son, to die, and there was a sundering of the Godhead. That is the force of God giving up his son. It is to die, committing him, delivering him over, experiencing the wrath of God. That's why I belabored that point, but I think perhaps it was missed. Just to, to add to the aspect of son title, very quickly, and I see there are more questions, so it's warming up. That's good. Uh, the fact that Christ is the Son of God, Sister White makes it very clear he is not a son by adoption. That means he cannot be decreed to be a son. Let's give, give you an illustration. If you go and adopt a child, you get a decree from the government that says this uh, person is now entitled as your son. He has the title of your son. Isn't that right? But he is not really your son, is he? No, not truly. He has not come from your very being. He is decreed legally. That's true. He is legally your son. That's a title attributed to him, decreed to him. He is adopted into that position. Christ is truly the son of God. He has not been decreed into that position. He truly is of the Father. That's what the scripture brings out. And I just mentioned this because it, it uh, like Randy said, it affects other aspects of truth. But that's just a thought to keep in mind because she does say it's not by adoption that he is a son. I have two questions, one for you, Natter, if I may, and one for you, Cheryl. And since Cheryl is my daughter-in-law, I'm going to treat you like I did my children when I taught church school. So I will ask Natter the first question, and you can sc scream and wonder how, what will I ask you. But you may both answer it. Uh, Natter, see if I understand your uh, position on Holy Spirit, who is in, involved in this. Simplified, Holy Spirit is Father's mind to us. Is that too much of a simplification? Is that okay? That's one definition of, it's much more than just that, but that yep. is correct. Okay, <clears throat> where in Scripture, except when Bible writers describe Satan's philosophy, where does it state intelligence can exist without material form and functioning condition, such as needed for sensory organs, for data input, analysis, processing, forming opinions, decision-making, and expression? There is no Bible verse that says all that. Uh, well, or, okay, or let me clarify. In one verse. A, a Bible verse that states intelligence can exist without form. Okay, the, the very fact that the Bible talks about the Spirit of God doing all these things, Spirit by definition, and as the Hebrews understood it, they never understood that the Spirit of God is a being or is an individual. Now, I believe it is possible for God to do these things. What might seem ununderstandable or hard to comprehend for us does not require us to come up with an idea that says, well, that's, that doesn't make sense, so that must be another person. God is God. He does things beyond us. We cannot explain how God speaks and things happen, but we all believe it. 
But if we were asked to explain it, no one can explain it. I can't explain how God by His Spirit can operate on our hearts here. But I believe it because the Scripture makes it clear. So the Spirit is the mind of God, is the presence, it's the power of God. And I believe God can do things that we can't understand. How would you relate that to s Satan is the one that, only one that I know of, that speaks of material entity, I mean uh, intelligent entity without physical form. Satan is the only one in the Bible that does that. I'm sh not sure I don't understand. Okay. You're saying Satan doesn't have a physical form and yet is intelligent? No, no. Uh, Satan is the only one that speaks of intelligence not having a physical form. I don't, um, I don't understand. Okay. I don't know what you mean. So, so Immortality so, of the soul? No, so Saul went down to the witch of Endor. Okay. All and right. so there is an example where Satan is saying there can be intelligence without material form. Yes, of course. Okay, I see what so you're saying. So Satan yeah. says that, but I don't see where God... Yes, as far as human beings are concerned, our existence cannot occur outside our body. God made our spirit to be confined to our body. We cannot send our spirit elsewhere, and when we die, the spirit does not exist as an intelligence. But we cannot place this limitation on God. God is God. And he, that's right, he has an, uh, the ability to be everywhere present by his spirit. He does not need someone else to do that for him. He is well capable of doing that. But I don't understand how he can do that. But Satan has perverted things, as far as humans are concerned, to try and make us like God. That's his whole idea. We are not like God in every way, shape, or form. We are limited human beings. So th there is a deception as far as man is concerned, but I don't believe we can apply that to God because he's limitless. Okay. I see a lot of hands, but I guess if you don't have a mic, y we won't hear you. So I, I, I ask suppose that's how question? the mic is making its way. I have no more comment. My second question, Cheryl. Go ahead. Uh, am I correct in memory that you did not refer to the table of showbread in your presentation? That there was a triad. In the um, in the holy place, and that the showbread was one of the triad. Oh, she did. Okay, yeah. I may have missed that. My question is: I realize the scope of individualized topics on this subject are are vast that you're presenting on. However, did you have a reason for not mentioning uh, the the table of showbread specifically? And either way, what is your Bible view of it? Of the table um, of I was running out of time, but um, I did present that it was um, that there were triads all through the sanctuary service, and that was one. Now the table of showbread, um, I believe that the, the twelve cakes were uh, representative of the twelve tribes of of Israel, and and God is a God of order, as you see, as you look at the whole sanctuary system, the the cubits and so on and so forth. Um, and so I believe that God was being very logical, and instead of having a stack of 12, he had them in, in two. And I believe that, that that perhaps also represented the Urim and the Thummim, which the priests wore on their breastplate. And of course, it's not going to list the 12 tribes, because it would take up too much space, and I think it was just for order. I don't think that you can make the leap and say that that's referring to a Dayun Godhead. To me, that's, that is a leap. I have a quick thought to add to that. Uh, yeah, Dayun Godhead is, is, is not a scriptural term, so I, I, I don't like that description. I, I prefer what the scripture says, uh, Father and Son. Uh, if we look at the sanctuary, how many beings were in the sanctuary? The sanctuary has room for the high priest and the God who sits on the throne in the most holy place. And there are the angels, of course, that are interwoven there. And, and that sets the tone for interpreting any other aspect of the sanctuary. But... You can go all kinds of places with the furniture, but if you follow the Bible uh, examples, you cannot go wrong. But there's lots of other questions, so that's just a thought. Hi, I have a question for Nader. Or Nader excuse me. Um, if I understand you correctly, uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but, but this is hopefully a synthesis of what, what you believe, that you don't believe that the Holy Spirit is is an independent entity apart from the other two members of the Godhead. 
Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's not a separate being to the Father and the Son okay. besides that. Okay, well, I, ha I, have, I have a scriptural comment on that. The first is um, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Now, m most of us, of course, follow the King James, but um, it, this is in the margin of, of many Bibles. The literal Greek is the Lord, the Spirit, at the end of the verse. So to me, that, that implies that the Spirit is, is also called the Lord as, as Jesus is called the Lord, and in other instances, God or the Father is called the Lord. Number two, um, in uh, Hebrews 9.14, uh, the Spirit is called the Eternal Spirit. And last, and maybe most important, in uh, John 14, when uh, Christ makes his uh, first promise of the Holy Spirit, um, he says, I will give you another comforter. Now, the word that is another in the Greek is the word alos. Now, as, as Brother Randy could probably exegete to you better than I can, the word alos means one apart from and equal to the other, meaning the one who was talking about it, meaning Jesus Christ. The, the opposite of that is the word heteros, which Paul uses in Galatians chapter 1 when he says, um, cursed is he who proclaims another gospel. So there's one, there's one that, you know, the alos that Jesus uses, to me, heavily implies that the Holy Spirit is an independent entity and he is equal to himself. Okay, good questions. Let's tackle, let's tackle them quickly one at a time. Second Corinthians, Corinthians, Corinthians 3.18. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there so you can read it for yourself. Uh, it says, but we all with open face beholding... Uh, I'm sorry, verse 17 was the question. No, no, 18. 18, okay. All right, so we're in the right place. Uh, open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Lord the Spirit. You first, right after him. Correct. Okay. The Lord, the Spirit. Uh, verse 17 is the lead up to that. And verse 17 tells us, it's talking about the same Spirit. And it says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Who is the only one that can bring us liberty? Only the one who said, if the Son therefore make you free, you shall be free indeed. That's the liberty I want. And that's the liberty that's talked about here. Only the Son can make us free. And the Son does that. He's the Lord. He is that Spirit that brings us liberty. In Hebrews, it talks about the eternal spirit because God is eternal. The spirit is of the eternal God. Therefore, it is an eternal spirit. And uh, finally, in uh, uh, John, where it talks about Christ sending another spirit, it's very true. Hetero, uh, heteros is not the word used. He used alos. Alos means more of the same, essentially. One just like it. Uh, okay, apart from. Now, Christ explains himself if we look at uh, that chapter because he, he gives us all these wonderful explanations. Uh, John chapter... 14 is it let's have a look here quickly so if you have your bibles you can follow quickly in john chapter 14 notice what he says uh, john 14 verse 16 and that's the verse uh, our brother bill here is asking about john 14 16 he says i'll pray the father he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever now christ here is speaking a language to to show to his disciples something important about a transition that will take place. Now he explains himself, who is this other comforter? Is it somebody different to him or is it himself? Just a few verses later in verse 18, and we covered that in the, in the study. Verse 18, notice what Christ says. He says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The other comforter is Christ himself coming to us in another form. In another manner. Not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Now when Jesus says, I will come, he only says it one other time in the Gospels. There was one man who had a dying child. And he came to Jesus. And Jesus said, I will come. And none of us believe that he sent Peter or John instead. He himself went. The same Jesus said the same thing here. And I believe he means what he says. While we're on this verse here, if we look at... Uh, this expansion of 17. He says, the spirit of truth, also another title for the comforter, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, because for he dwells with you and shall be in you. Then he says in verse uh, 8, 
uh, at 19 and uh, on 20. Yet a little while you shall see me no more, because I live, you shall live also 20. At that day you shall know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. So the Spirit of Truth is going to be in you. And here he says, I will be in that day. I will be in you. Then he expands to say, he that keeps my commandments, has my commands and keeps them. Uh, he loves me and uh, he shall love me, uh, shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now he's asked a question by one of the disciples. How? And uh, this question was asked here, uh, I think, in the back there. How does this happen? How does the spirit, uh, can it operate with intelligence and not without being, without body? You know? How? Jesus was asked that question. And uh, he didn't answer it. But his answer, his question was, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Remember back in verse 17, who was not going to be received by the world? Because it didn't see him, didn't know him, spirit of truth. The disciple understood very clearly who Jesus is talking about. What they were concerned about is how. Jesus didn't answer that. He said the same thing as he did in verse 21. Again, if a man loves me, he will keep my words, and I will love, my Father will love him, and we will come and make our abode with him. The spirit of his Father and the spirit of Christ, they come in their divine, all divine form, divested of humanity. You know, Christ is the only one that had humanity. They come as the spirit. Um, I, just I have to interrupt here for a few moments. Um, we are, we've got about, if we extend it a little bit extra long, we could do that for 10 minutes, and you'd get out a little bit late for lunch. Do you want to extend this another 10 minutes? Yes. All right, so you've got 10 minutes, and it's over. Don't we have a say in this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the honey thing is at 1 o'clock, too, so... Uh, but we'll take it another 10 minutes. And uh, I'll tell you what, this has been great, hasn't it? Amen. Really, we are learning a lot of things. And some of you may be concerned, well, is this kind of set up? Because most all the questions are going to Nader's side. Yeah. Well, well, the reason the that to is happening is because he has brought the different right. view to us. He has to defend. And that's where the most questions are being directed. Right. But no, uh, we need to direct questions to both sides if you can do a little of that. <laughs> right. Otherwise, I'm going to sit down and be quiet, and uh, we're going to quit here at 11 o'clock sharp and get ready for the next yeah. meeting. We don't want to cut Bill Daniels out. Well, just wanted to comment that we're shooting the message and not the messengers, okay? <laughs> but just to comment on John 16, uh, 16 um, that whole section, as you read it, um, I believe it's, it's the same Elohim Godhead. That's why Christ could say what he did. And as you read it in context, he's also talking about the fact that he was going to be uh, his death and his resurrection, and his. Uh, some have even said that it also had a dual application to when Christ came again. But I do think we need to be careful in making leaps. Um, from what I'm understanding, there's the Father, there's the Son. Then there is the Spirit of the Son, and being that they're two different people, there would be also the Spirit of God. So that's four. So you could argue and say, well, uh, you, could make, you can build any argument. Pulling out of the blue, you could say, okay, well, that four is what Ezekiel 1.10 was speaking about when it spoke about the four faces. And you could say, well, the table of showbread had four sides, so God is four. And then you could make the leap and say, well, that's what Ezekiel 9 was talking about, and that's what the abomination is. So we need to be careful with what I see as taking leaps. Uh, there is only one spirit, Ephesians 4, 4. And that spirit, the Father, gave without measure to his son, John three thirty four, because he loved him. The Father loves the son, John three thirty five, the next verse. And has given all things into his hands. The spirit comes from the Father, proceeds forth from the Father, John fifteen twenty six, And 
who also proceeds from the Father? Jesus said, I proceeded forth and came from the Father, John 8, 42. And so the Father's Spirit flows through the Son to us. This is exactly the words that Ellen White expressed in De- Desire of Ages, page 14, uh, 21. Through the Son, the Father's life flows out to all. And, of course, it returns in a tide of uh, benef- uh, praise and thanksgiving to the great source of all, because the Father is the one of whom are all things, even his spirit, through the Son. Desire of Ages, I believe, says that Christ has linked himself with humanity with bonds that are never to be broken. Forever will he retain his human, human nature, which tells me, that Christ is not omnipresent at this time. He is in one place, and therefore he is only available to us through the ministry of the Spirit. He is in the holy, uh, most holy place pr- performing intercession. So, you know, uh, I, maybe am I wrong? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong in that, but that's my understanding, that he cannot be... Uh, everywhere at once. He only is everywhere at once through the ministry of his spirit. That's right. That's right. Uh, sorry, just quickly. I never read this anywhere. I know that sounds like a reasonable deduction, but Christ, before he left this earth, he took on a human form, but he did say to the Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee. And before he left, he said, Lo, I am with you always. Christ is everywhere present by his Holy Spirit. He is omnipresent. Mrs. White says he represents himself as the omnipresent one. His spirit is the presence of the omnipresent one. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong, but I just haven't seen that anywhere. And, uh, but just, just a thought. Inspiration does talk about him, not someone else, being present on his behalf because he can't do it anymore. <laughs> I wanted like to wife's refer to a, a scripture where well, we're on the same subject in Revelation chapter 5 where the lamb, as was slain, stands before the throne, his father sitting on the throne. He's going to receive the uh, scroll in the hand. And he is depicted as having seven horns. Omnip- omnipotence, right? A horn is power. Seven, complete power. Om- omnipotence. And seven eyes. Omni- omniscience, all-seeing. And these eyes are said to be the seven spirits of God which go forth into all the, th- all the earth. The Son, the Lamb, Jesus, has now restored to him all the powers that he laid aside when he came to be man on earth. He retains his human nature. He is the one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2.5. But he now has his spirit. He, he has the seven spirits of God. He says this into the letter of the church of Sardis in chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 1. These things say he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He has. These are the, this is the spirit of Christ which goes forth into all the earth. And that spirit may dwell in us through faith. Paul tells us in Ephesians 3, uh, 15 and 16. The spirit of God who strengthens the inner man so that Christ may dwell in you by faith. It speaks about in Revelation before the throne, the seven spirits. And as I was showing in one of my presentations, you you consistently see the the triad, the triune Godhead in Revelation. And in in Revelation 4, 5, it talks about seven spirits uh, proceeding from the throne. So I believe there is one throne. Revelation talks about the throne. And all three of the of the Godhead are are on that throne. Like my wife said, I ask a real short question. Great. <laughs> and I'll ask you, Nadar. When Ellen G. White was in Australia, she made this comment, and I want you to answer why she made this comment. It says, We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person walking through these grounds. How do you answer that? Thank you. That's a very good question. Ellen White uh, did not write those words. She preached them in a sermon when she was at Avondale. And uh, the context and the timing of the preaching has to do with, uh, helps us understand it. Now, that statement is in the book Evangelism. Uh, And and usually the cases when people uh, 
talk about the Godhead, they'll go to the book Evangelism. Now that's not the full context of the statement. Uh, the full context of the statement was only released 30 years after the publication of the book Evangelism. In other words, the editors of Evangelism found this statement in the vaults. They liked what that part said. They picked up that part, left the rest of it, put a full stop where Mrs. White puts a comma and continues, and they inserted it in, in the book Evangelism to promote a certain doctrine. And the picture that that puts in people's minds is the Holy Spirit is a being who walks around. But if you read it in, in context, and I'm happy to read that in context, I think Gary has it here. She's actually talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who walks among uh, the candlesticks. Let me read it a little bit here in context. It says, the Lord says this because he knows it is for our good. He would build a wall around us to keep us from transgression so that his blessing and love may be bestowed on us in rich measure. The Lord instructed us that this was the place where we should locate and build a school and so on. And then she says, the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds unseen by human eyes, that the Lord God is our keeper and helper. He hears every word we utter and knows every thought of the mind. She says he. So in her thinking, she's writing about one individual called the Lord. And how is it that the Lord works with us and operates with us here on earth? It's by the Spirit. And when he's working by his Spirit, he is no less of a person. He is as much a person as he was here on the flesh. We don't have less of him just because we can't see him. That's the point. And so we need to realize that. And uh, yeah, there are many statements here. Christ walks unseen through our streets. Uh, in the book of Revelation, he's represented as walking through the, mid, uh, through the candlesticks. That's Christ walking through his church on earth. He does that through his own spirit. But that is not less of him. That is as much him. Again, we're seeing the triune Godhead here. And in my uh, presentation, I believe it was yesterday, I gave quote after quote after quote of Sister White referring to three persons, the, th the trio, the three powers. I cannot accept that. You can find those details in this little book, by the way, the context and other statements that explain and clarify that. Uh, that's on the table outside. Mike. My question is the Trinitarian view. Um, in Romans 1, 19, it says, uh, 120, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So that, to me, is telling me that his creation is, that he created man in his own image, male and female, how do you explain this verse in regards to um, creation? Do you understand my question? I, how do you explain I'm sorry? Romans one twenty, where he is created man in his own image, that it's to the Trinitarian? Okay. okay. Um... It's hard for me to weed through my material here, but in one of my presentations, um, I was showing that y you never see the male-female relationship being referred to uh, in the Godhead. And I gave uh, some different scripture about how that relates to the, the moral mind. It refers to dominion um, um, in, in the New Testament. But, but you never find it, the male-female relationship as, as referring to uh, the Godhead. And I, if I have time, I'll find those, those verses that I'm speaking of that does not that make another relationship. These dear people will be on the campground for the next two or three days and freely answer all the questions you bring to them, I just I'm have sure. One question. Okay. I just have one question, please. All right. Yes, you have well, just one more question, a lot please. Of more, and it is time. Okay, Brian, you've been waiting quite a while. Everybody wants you to have your question. I think this could be a good summation for everyone, if possible, as the Spirit leads. Um, I'm seeing here that that as we know, Christ went back to heaven, okay, and he sent another comforter. He refers to the other comforter as he, but yet we know that he, he said, 
is a, is a spirit of, of Christ, uh, as spoken of in, in Romans chapter 8 as well. So here we see, you can say, uh, it's, it's another, but it's not Christ, but it's another. Or you can say, it is Christ, and yet both points would be dead on mm-hmm. without controversy. Because there's a triune Godhead, I believe. Well, whether you want to say a triune or the Father and the Son and their spirit... You can, you can say two or three. It, it wouldn't matter really when it comes down to it. It doesn't change the unification of the Father and the Son and their spirit working according, uh, accordingly with one, any, one, one another in one accord just as he would have us as a body That's with true. them as well. That's true. The words we use are biblical. The words we use, it's the concepts that we understand. We can use the same words that mean different things. And this is where the difference is. Uh, the Catholics call Sunday keeping Sabbath keeping. But we, we have two different concepts of the same word, meaning two different things. So some people will say he and another with a different concept and someone else, like you said. And so that's why maybe we're exploring it a little bit beyond just the common words to see what is the concept and the thought behind the word that is portrayed. But what you said is true. I agree with you. But it comes down to what do we understand by what we say. That's all. I, I, um, I appreciate what Brian said, too. The only thing I'm hearing is... A theory rather than a question. If he didn't ask you a question, he told you what he thought. It was a summation. And so we're kind of so we're kind of getting distracted a little bit. And, and, I, th- I think it's been a healthy thing, though, don't you? Really? And uh, I'm I'm telling you, folk, we better take another look at this thing. Pastor John, we really better take another look. Yeah. I just wanted to mention that we do have available um, a summary bullets of the things that we presented. Just one handout. I, um, I think that that's uh, healthy. Every both sides, you know, they have their literature out there. This is um, a bulletin summary that Cheryl's presented of what she had to offer. And Keith, I'd like you standing at the door back there, and those that want one should make them available. Uh, leave one for me, because I want to look at all of it. Thank you. <laughs> if we need to print up more, we will. All right, I'll blow the